Special Sheriff, pray, give us order. Williams College, a community of people who find their joy in the adventure of learning, exploration, and discovery, is excited to welcome Dr. Maud Mandel as its 18th president. We have been inspired by her scholarship, her time at Brown University, and for her joy of learning and teaching. We are eager to become partners with her vision of how learning communities may be environments of integrity that could change the world through their work, their play, their exploration, and their questions. Our world is facing many challenges, and we at Williams are eager to engage our society with ideas and solutions that spring from our community's values which include inclusivity and diversity, striving for justice and sustainability in our communities and in our world. These values have become part of the Williams spirit. As a result, President Mandel's invitation to re-examine the systems and individuals through the lens of inside-outside has captured our imaginations. President Mandel has challenged us to ask new questions related to who we are as a learning community, who is inside and who is outside, what is inside of us as members of this community, and the complex relationships between how those things are related to the insides and outsides of ourselves as individuals. Our new chapter in Williams' history begins with a new partnership and a world of possibilities. In the coming days, may we eagerly embrace the challenges, the inspiration, and the partnership with our whole hearts, soul, and minds. Welcome to Williams College, President Mandel. Please be seated.
Good afternoon. I'm Michael Eisenson, and I have the privilege of serving as chair of the Board of Trustees of Williams College and the distinct pleasure to welcome you here today to celebrate the induction of Maud S. Mandel as the 18th president of our college. We're especially pleased to have such broad representation from every part of our community. We have with us today faculty representing virtually all academic departments, students, staff, alumni spanning almost 80 class years, members of the Williamstown community, as a part of which we are deeply entwined, and delegates representing many of our peer in academic institution, at least three of which are represented by presidents drawn from our own faculty ranks here at Williams. Perhaps most importantly, we're pleased to officially welcome Maud's family, her husband Steve, her children, Lev and Ava, and scores of other family and friends. Among those on stage with me today are representatives of the Board of Trustees and of the Presidential Search Committee, Brown University President Chris Paxson, who will share her thoughts with us later in the program, and, and here and in the row in front of me, a remarkable five people who have provided distinguished service as president of Williams College. I now have the very pleasant duty of introducing several other individuals on the stage to offer greetings to President Mandel on the occasion of her introduction, of her induction, I'm sorry. I will in introduce all of them at this point and they will in turn come to the podium to offer words of welcome. From the students, Lizzie Hibbard and Moises Roman Mendoza, both members of the great class of 2019 and co-presidents of the College Council, from the staff, Rachel Lewis, Assistant Director of the Center for Development Economics. From the faculty, Denise Buell, Professor of Religion and Dean of the Faculty. From the alumni, Kate Ramsdell, Class of 1997 and Vice President of the Society of Alumni. From the Williamstown community, Ann O'Connor, Class of 1986 and Chair of the Williamstown Select Board. And from the academic delegates, Professor Deborah Cohen of Northwestern University. Let me now turn over to the College Council co-presidents. Good afternoon. Before we begin, we want to take a moment to acknowledge that Williams College sits on the territory of the Mohican Nation and is traditionally inhabited by the Mohawk and Nipmuc Nations as well. Now, President Mandel, trustees, and honored guests, on behalf of the student body, we are honored to welcome President Mandel to Williams and to witness the historic induction of our first female president. In Providence, you had a population of 180,000 people. In Williamstown, there are 8,000, and I think half of those are cows. <laughs> so welcome to our booming metropolis. For our size, <laughs> Williams does a lot. Students develop genuine, meaningful relationships with their professors here. We have the oldest alumni society in the country. We have a fantastic history of student activism. And every year, Williams students volunteer to help weatherize the homes of local community members, tutor students, and provide consulting services to nearby businesses. We were also the first college to make cap and gown standard at graduation, so Brown has that to thank us for. <laughs> this though, would not be a true welcome without addressing our faults and our flaws. Williams was not intended to look like it does today. It was not intended for people of color, for women, and for so many other students that contribute to our community. What Williams looks like today came from the hard work of past, present, and present students, faculty, staff, and administrators. Let's acknowledge their achievements and continue their work. Today, the summer earnings contribution requires that financial aid students pay Williams a significant amount of what they make every summer, limiting their intellectual freedom and access to opportunities. We are need blind for our domestic students, but not for our international students. If we want to foster genuine space of inclusion, we cannot continue to perpetuate this implicit hierarchy. On campus, too many students are struggling with mental health. We've expanded our mental health services, but we need to address the underlying causes of this epidemic and reduce barriers to accessing counseling. 
In order to meaningfully address these issues, we ask you, President Mandel, to work with us and listen to student perspectives. Students care so deeply about Williams. We have to, otherwise we would have chosen somewhere with better weather. <laughs> there is so much potential here in our little town, but it takes hard, thoughtful work to create real change. Students here fought for Africana studies and Latinx studies. They are still, after three decades, fighting for Asian American studies. We must support them in these efforts. The student body looks forward to working with you during your time here, President Mandel. With your help, we hope to fulfill our mission statement, which so eloquently reads, Williams should not be regarded as a privilege destined to create further privilege, but rather as a privilege that creates the opportunity and responsibility to serve society at large. So we welcome you, President Mandel, to our flawed, beautiful, and complicated school. Thank you. President Mandel, on behalf of the 867 staff of Williams College, welcome. In just two months here, you have already learned more about my department, the Center for Development Economics, than many who have been here for years. Your interest and willingness to meet with our 27 graduate students from across the developing world has been noted with enthusiasm by our program faculty, staff, and students. It seems to be a good sign that you have already embraced a program that is sometimes felt to be tangential to the mission of Williams College. Of course, I would disagree with this assessment. Despite that the, f the fact that our students are older than the undergraduates and that we are physically located on the edge of campus, the CDE is in many ways a microcosm of what all of us value at Williams. Our students make up a diverse community who live, eat, study, and socialize together. Many of them arrive unfamiliar with the concept of the liberal arts and with little experience of having direct and frequent contact with their faculty. In just 10 months, they graduate with a master's degree and return to their home countries. They leave Williamstown having built a network not just of friends, but of colleagues from around the globe. They continue to learn from each other and to grow in their roles as policymakers. And they, rem in, they remain devoted fans of Williams College going as far as to name children and hiking trails after Williams faculty and even after Williams itself. A few people here may already know that I first met Maude in the summer of 1981 at the Hartsbend Farm Camp, just away up the road in Newfane, Vermont. While day-to-day -day life at camp and at Williams may be very different, there are some similarities. Camp brought together a group of kids and counselors and dropped us in an intense environment. Within a safe setting, we were given more space and freedom than most of us had ever had before. We were challenged to try new things and supported in our efforts. Those I've stayed in touch with from camp often describe the experience as one of the most formative of their lives, in much the same way as Williams alumni think of their college experience. President Mandel, you have already shown that you will take an interest in all of the wonderful components that make up Williams College, whether they involve thousands of people or just a few. The staff at Williams is diverse, and many of us work in small departments or behind the scenes in roles that sometimes feel overlooked. If your interaction with the CDE is any indication, I know that you will help the campus as a whole recognize that each one of us, staff, students, and faculty, plays a role in helping Williams be the formative institution it is. So to you, President Mandel, and to your family, welcome and mazel tov. Good afternoon. President Maude Mandel, it is my honor and privilege to offer you greetings on behalf of the Williams College faculty. Six other historians have led Williams College. Tyler Dennett, James Finney Baxter, Jack Sawyer, Frank Oakley, Hank Payne, and Bill Wagner. But we've never had a historian like you. You are the first to work at the intersection of modern and Jewish, modern French and Jewish histories. And yes, you are the first female historian to serve as president. Indeed, we celebrate you as the first woman to lead the college in its 225 years. 
Maude, we value the experience that you bring as an alumna of a small liberal arts college, my hometown, and a long, as a longtime faculty member of a university deeply devoted to undergraduate education. You join us as an accomplished faculty member whose devotion to teaching has been channeled into enhancing student learning broadly, and how fitting it is to have a president whose research can inform and support our institutional commitments to inclusivity. Your scholarship has focused on minoritized religious, racial, and ethnic communities in modern France, using a historian's fine-grained commitment to attention to historical context, you have illuminated the resonances and differences between communities responding to the trauma of genocide, and you have shown how stories of conflict resonate differently among differently minoritized groups, how they arose and remain per pervasive and influential. We look forward to benefiting from how your expertise can help us to assess the stories we live by and to produce ones that can enable all of us to flourish because of and with our differences in this college community, in this region, in this country, and in the world. One of your first acts this summer was to meet with the chairs of all academic programs and departments. More than this, you took it upon yourself to go to the faculty, meeting with chairs in their offices. This impulse to meet faculty where we work is deeply appreciated. I know the idea was born of your own experience as a faculty member at Brown with a then new president, and we're really grateful that you're bringing good ideas with you to Williams. You bring the talents to lead with us. We are excited to have you work with us to imagine and to implement a vision for continuing to offer our students the very best education. My faculty colleagues and I offer you and your family, your husband Steve and your daughter Ava and your son Lev, the warmest welcome to Williams and Williamstown. We are delighted to have you as part of our community. President Mandel, on behalf of the Society of Alumni, I'm honored to welcome you to the Williams family. During your tenure, we will celebrate the bicentennial of the Society, the oldest organization of its kind in the country. I am certain, based on the fact that you've already painted your door purple, that you'll be ready to celebrate with the 29,000 living alumni who are planning to show up for the festivities in 2021. Small liberal arts colleges often make the news these days because we're told that our brand of learning, teaching, and living is in peril. Yet here you are, in the early days of your presidency, assuring all of us that the strengths that have made Williams one of the best schools of its kind for over 200 years in the world is ready to become even better, while also reassuring us that you will work to understand and hold on to the fabric of the culture that has made us who we are. I can bet I'm not alone in loving the fact that when you spent time on campus during the presidential search, the Williams community made it so clear to you and your family, and this is your quote, that its tight-knit and supportive culture, its whimsical sense of humor, and its intellectual energy are what drew you to the place. The Purple Mountains and the facilities that we have are certainly an important part of the Williams experience, but I'm sure, as you have already found and you will continue to find, it is the people that make this place extraordinary. Diverse, energetic, proud, collaborative, creative, forward-thinking, and ever critical and questioning, because isn't that what a liberal arts education is supposed to do for us? Williams alumni embody the mission of the college and all that we do and all that we are in the world. You have had a chance to meet many of us and to hear our stories. I hope that we have allowed you to begin to understand the far-ranging and deep impact that a Williams education has once we all leave the Purple Valley. You've shared your interest in developing meaningful, collaborative, and inclusive partnerships with all of the constituents of the Williams community, and as alumni, we will share that goal with you. I look forward to getting to know you over the course of the coming years in my role with this society, but on behalf of all of us, if there is anything that any one of us can do to make you, Steve, Lev, 
and Ava feel at home, don't hesitate to ask. Our purple doors are open. President Mandel, on behalf of the residents of Williamstown, I would like to welcome you, your husband Steve, and your children Lev and Ava, to our town. We hope that you have already found your way into the thriving world that exists outside the campus perimeter, be it hiking trails or restaurants, farms or museums, or the living rooms of friendly new neighbors. We wish Ava the best of luck on her first day at the brand new Mount Greylock Regional School, whose opening was conveniently delayed until after this ceremony <laughs> so that she gets a chance to be the center of your attention that day. As roughly the seventh female chair of the select board and in a town indebted to the contributions of women leaders, including the tireless and valiant Carrie Green, I am pleased to see that Williams College has finally caught up with the town in choosing a woman to serve in a top leadership role. <laughs> For its part, the town elected its first woman leader already back in 1960, right around the time the college was diversifying by hiring its first Catholic professors, Frank Oakley and Dan O'Connor. As residents of Williamstown, we would like to reiterate how enthusiastically we support and embrace the college's mission of inclusion, a topic truly as dear to us as it is to you. We recognize how we all gain from welcoming the stranger, the newcomer, the outsider into our community. Through the Center for Learning and Action, Williams students are increasingly involving themselves in aspects of town life and our surrounding community including helping out in schools, and we are all the richer for it. Obviously, the town-gown relationship is long and deep and, history shows, occasionally even bumpy. So to help you get up to speed, we are offering you a copy of the town's official history book, <laughs> Williamstown, the first 250 years. Since our very first days together, Williamstown and Williams College have been so closely intertwined as to be, in Fred Rudolph's words, inseparable, something those unnamed defectors uh, uh, never understood. <laughs> Williamstown may be, as a student complained in 1812, in a wilderness without even a stagecoach to connect it with the outside world. <laughs> And yet, without the irresistible and enduring qualities of the town once named West Hoosick, Ephraim Williams would surely have donated his fortune elsewhere, and none of us would be standing here today. President Mandel, welcome to Williamstown. happy responsibility of conveying the well wishes to other, of other colleges to Williams on the appointment of President Mandel. Maude is the most reasonable and fair-minded person I know, um, which is undoubtedly evident to those of you who've already met her. And I should say I know a lot of really reasonable and fair-minded people. This was a hard competition. She listens scrupulously, and in her everyday dealings, as in her marvelous scholarship, is extraordinarily astute in understanding the investments that underlie the positions that people take, whether those are political or religious or economic, ideological, familial. It's also the case that Maud, having worked out the stakes, is extraordinarily crisp in her decision making. She knows the importance of resolution and of moving forward. And in fact, that word forward is a word I always hear in Maud's voice. She acts courageously, taking on herself the burden of hard choices. In the nearly 20 years that I've known her as a colleague and as a friend, I've always admired this, 
this quality of hers, both when I've agreed with her and also when I've been on the other side. For an institution such as Williams, which is already superb by every measure conceivable, and also takes community and the collective good so seriously, I really can't imagine a better choice than Maud. Her passion for education as a way of living and for diversity as a moral, intellectual, and also a pragmatic good chime in perfectly with Williams's traditions and with its future. Where there are new directions to embark on, she'll find the harmony in the inevitable discord of college life. She talks forthrightly, but without edge. She has a remarkable ability to shape a consensus precisely because it's clear that she so respects the commitment and the hard work and the smarts of people who are on the other side. And since I'm here to represent all institutions of higher learning, I want also to say that in all of the conversations I've had with colleagues who know Maud, the consensus has been lucky, lucky Williams. <laughs> so welcome, Maud, Steve, Lev, and Ava. Um, and congratulations, w Williams, on the wisdom of your decision. But be prepared to deal with the envy of your colleagues at other places. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all for your warm words of welcome. Before adding my own welcome on behalf of the Board of Trustees, I want to acknowledge the students, faculty, staff, and trustees who served on the Presidential Search Committee, <clears throat> many of whom are on stage today. This group was critically involved, along with the Board, in getting us to this wonderful occasion, having collectively dedicated literally thousands of hours to ensuring that Williams College found the very best person to serve as our 18th president. We were fortunate to be doing our work on the strongest possible platform, as the college has never been in a better position than it is today. We heard repeatedly in our discussions with academic leaders across the country that the quality of our faculty and students, the soundness of our operations, the strength of our financial position, and fundamental to each of these, the passionate commitment of our alumni are broadly recognized and widely admired throughout higher education. It's well understood that sustained institutional excellence requires great leadership. In my lifetime, Williams has had the benefit of a remarkable group of people who have filled the role of president, a group to which we are adding another extraordinary member today. Jack Sawyer, whose term arrived <laughs> whose term ended just as I arrived on campus in 1973, guided Williams through the almost infinite nuances of exiting the fraternity system and entering the era of coeducation. John Chandler, who led the college during my own time as a student and beyond, brought a distinctive talent for translating ambitious ideas and intentions into fully articulated programs and shepherded the then radical changes to seamless fruition. Frank Oakley, whose 40 years on the Williams faculty included eight years as president, moved Williams to significantly increase our racial diversity and fundamentally ingrained our commitment to supporting faculty excellence in both teaching and research. Hank Payne, who was an early advocate of the kind of collaboration with our local community that has led to important investments by the college in and around Berkshire County and to programs that now attract half our student body to service each year. Carl Vogt, who stepped up from the board to lead the college in a particularly challenging moment, won people over with his Texan warmth and demonstrated an enormous talent for navigating in choppy water. Morty Shapiro, who also came out of the faculty ranks and who spearheaded the development of exciting new programs in times of plenty and responded with equal vigor and creativity when changed economic circumstances required. Bill Wagner, who led us through a pre presidential transition during the financial crisis, overseeing a disciplined process that kept Williams in good health and moving forward. Adam Falk, 
who led the evolution of both our management practices and our physical structures into the modern era, including both the most significant rebuilding of the college facilities in our history and the largest capital campaign in the history of the liberal arts to make sure we could pay for them. And most recently, Tiku Majumder, who set aside his storied teaching and research career to keep us moving through that campaign and those essential building projects as we took the time necessary to find our newest president. As we're fortunate to have five of these former leaders with us today, I'd like you to join me in thanking them for the care, commitment, and effectiveness with which they stewarded our school. It has been a great privilege for me to have known eight of the last nine leaders of our college and to have worked closely with four of them. It was also a true privilege to have participated with my colleagues in the search that led us to today. And it is a particular honor for me to add my welcome to Maud Mandel as our 18th president with complete conviction that she will be an exemplary addition to this remarkable group. The excellence of our college, created by generations of faculty, staff, students, and alumni, and fostered and sustained by great leadership over many years, allowed us to attract extraordinary candidates to our search and to realize the aspirations expressed by the many hundreds of people in our community who helped us to describe the person we sought as our next president. We sought and we found in Maud Mandel a vigorous and accomplished leader with a record of lively, distinguished, and creative scholarly achievement and a demonstrated appreciation for the values and the culture of academic life. In the poetic language of two members of our English faculty who helped create the prospectus for our search, we sought as well, and we found, a person whose classroom engagement revealed the soul of a teacher and who enjoys and has thrived among intelligent, vibrant undergraduates. On this note, Maud made many astute observations during the hours and hours of interviews to which she graciously acceded, but one resonates particularly for me at this moment in the cycle of campus life across the country, and that is her observation that student activism is to be embraced and encouraged as the much preferred alternative to a lack of student interest. One of the many refreshing times when she pointed without hesitation to the half full portion of the glass. Indeed, the pure joy with which she spoke of her student engagements throughout our discussions made a lasting impression on all of us, perhaps best captured by the image of Maud set up at a picnic table at the heart of the Brown campus inviting students to come share cookies with the dean on the green. With Maud Mandel as both a member and the leader of our community, I believe that Williams College will continue to attract an excellent and ever more engaged and diverse faculty, staff, and student body, all of whom will have every opportunity to enjoy success. She has a profound commitment to diversity in its fullest definition and a well-developed and well-exercised set of skills for ensuring that diversity in hiring and admissions leads to deep and true inclusion. She brings as well an instinct for working in close collaboration with faculty and students, a thoughtful listener who thrives on discussion, with a reputation for balancing personal confidence with a genuine respect for different points of view. At the same time, she has a demonstrated willingness to make change even when it might not be immediately embraced by all. An essential appreciation that consensus building should precede change when possible, but also the wisdom and the courage to know when consensus might necessarily have to follow. We all believe that Williams has an obligation to exercise leadership beyond our own campus 
in ensuring the continued vitality of the liberal arts, evolving ourselves as future needs and opportunities unfold, serving as a model for others, and articulating on the national and international stage those values that we hold most deeply. Maud's dedication, and indeed even her vocabulary in this regard, is exceptional. Many of you have had the opportunity to hear Maud speak to the question of the role and the values of the liberal arts. If you haven't, you will be proud of being a part of this essential tradition and renewed in your conviction when you do. Maud brings to us the skills, the values, and the passion to preserve what is excellent about Williams College and also to help us aspire to embrace new opportunities in the continual op process of renewal and growth. She is committed to engaging the entire community in this process and she is already making her warmth, her ready smile, and her infectious energy felt widely on the campus and throughout the greater Williams community. It is therefore with great confidence, affection, and enthusiasm that I ask you to join me and the speakers before me in welcoming Maud Mandel to Chapin Hall on this September day to be inducted as the 18th president of Williams College. My notes here say, applause, hopefully. <laughs> Before we continue with the spoken program, we have the pleasure of a musical interlude, and we'll now hear from Chris Allen and Avery Sharp from the faculty, and Andrew Aramini, class of 2019, who will perform Compassion, which was also written by Chris Allen.
Thank you, Chris, Avery, and Andrew. It's now my pleasure to introduce President Mandel's friend and former colleague, Janet Cooper Nelson, Brown University's chaplain. It's fitting after such wonderful jazz to recite the Book of Mercy, Leonard Cohen, number 14. He says, blessed be the covenant of love between the hidden and the revealed. Your theme for today of inside and outside is in my mind as I invite you to go cycling with Mobius. You remember him, right? The guy with the pencil who can prove to you that there is no inside and outside, but only one side cycling for Mobius. Propelled by 17 toward 19 and beyond, a Mark Maudian of 10 plus 8 emerges. Range, gears, shift. Pedaling steadily a line particular, but continuous, inside, outside, emerges. Pedals, even dichotomous, engage the troublesome gears of structural binaries. Committed research, engagement, conversation, even friendship, expose, define, dismantle ancient controlling torque. A moment, a season, a sweet new year, herald continuity, tradition, and the never yet. An induction of new courage to be tested, trusted, engaged. Let us now tie carefully to Proust's celestial rope of memory so that we may risk descent into that abyss of our potential not being. Valleys where much is little known to us where erasure and exclusion is constant inside, outside, without, but not yet fully within. Awkwardly, strangers there, we from these climes shout an echoing welcome. We hope to be trusted, to be heard by the hopeful young who study. We seek riders from all climes, and we pedal with vision while not always with hope. Those who know the excruciating need for wisdom's light, for healing's help, just to be seen, our prayer is for these newest riders to be granted us each season. But they set new prerequisites for our work. They expose our need to teach to learn to engage in entirely new ways. They establish new moral metrics for our commitment to rescue, for our shuddering planet, for our faltering, badly pulsed political life. They insist that we be authentic, inclusive. They ask if we really can do more than spell compassion. So we seek to signal to those who arrive to glimpse these purple hills, these old halls and beloved byways for the first time. We seek to signal that they may here find joy and home, that they may explore collections Clarkian and find in this valley's autumn haze and winter's icy white new home. May all of this and more be theirs and ours. This President Mandel, our shared season's new leader, and so this human miraculous Mobian trace continues. It's remarkable William's ascent, persisting, prevailing, proposing, 
inside aspirations proved by outside's endurance, outside's voice proving inside's hope with substance. Ride on, Mobius. Maud joins your Williams ranks today, surrounded, encouraged, and compelled by these, the glorious purple clad, a cloud of witness, riders together. History holds us all to a sacred mark, the mark the miraculous Mobius first glimpsed, the already, the not yet, the before, the after, not sides regardless of that appearance, but the very structure of integrity, coherence, the sacred. May today mark a Williams place with Maud's compassion, intellect, and grace, a blessing. Thank you, Janet. It is our custom at Williams College to award honorary degrees on this occasion to people of great accomplishment in areas that we value deeply. Two individuals will be honored today, and I believe each upholds and indeed enhances the standards that we hope to recognize in this way. First, I would like to recognize with an honorary degree a person who has so deeply demonstrated accomplishment in her chosen field that we have asked her to be our next president. <laughs> Maud S. Mandel, academic life is in your DNA. The daughter of professors, you grew up in the university town of Princeton, embraced the liberal arts at Oberlin, and dove immediately into graduate school at Michigan. There, you developed your scholarly interest in the effects of policies and practices of inclusion and exclusion in France on ethnic and religious minorities, most notably Jews, Muslims, and Armenians. This work landed you at Brown, where you rose to become professor of history chair of the Judaic Studies program, and in time, dean of the college. In that role, you led efforts to enhance the curriculum, strengthen advising, advance learning in core competencies, and help students connect their academic, service, and life goals. In projects particularly close to your heart, you spurred initiatives to advance diversity and inclusion that resulted in a web of programs to support the academic and personal growth of previously underrepresented students. In your teaching, scholarship, and service, you have proven to be a deep thinker, a warm mentor and colleague, and a naturally collaborative leader. Brown is the better for your having been there. As an avid hiker, you may find the paths occasionally steeper in this new place and this next chapter of your life, but we trust you will find the views all the more breathtaking and the fulfillment all the greater. I hereby declare you recipient of the honorary degree Doctor of Laws entitled to all the rights, honors, and privileges appertaining thereto. We would also like to recognize with an honorary degree Brown University President Christina Paxson, who has also graciously agreed to share with us her thoughts regarding the induction of our new president, in whose career she has been deeply involved. Christina Hall Paxson, it is not easy to make a great institution even greater, but you have done so repeatedly in your career. As chair of the economics department at Princeton, you brought new levels of collegiality and collaboration to a department of academic stars. At the Woodrow Wilson School, you founded the Center for Health and Well-Being, drawing on your own study of how economic factors affect health and welfare throughout life. 
as the school's dean you then encourage other forms of interdisciplinarity for which the school is widely renowned as president of brown university your impact has been sweeping during your tenure the university has advanced its teaching and research fundamentally deepened student support and strengthened its role in the local community brown stature as a place of scholarship has never been higher you have launched a school of public health an institute for environment and society and an institute for public and international affairs you have shown how diversity and excellence are intertwined and enhanced both financial aid and the non-financial support systems for first generation students at the same time brown has become even more invested in the health of rhode island the record you have established is remarkable and now includes the mentoring of several colleagues who have gone on to college presidencies including one for whom Williams is today particularly grateful. I hereby declare you recipient of the honorary degree, Doctor of Laws, entitled to all the rights, honors, and privileges appertaining thereto. It is now my pleasure to ask President Paxson to offer her thoughts on the occasion of President Mandel's induction. Thank you and good afternoon. Let me say to the Board of Trustees, distinguished faculty, students, staff, alumni, and friends of Williams College, I have been looking forward to this day for some time, and I know my many friends from Brown who are here who've come up to cheer Maud on or are just as excited and happy as I am. I am very glad to be here uh, on this magnificent campus as you inaugurate <clears throat> my colleague, my friend, forever a friend of Brown University, Maud Mandel, to be your 18th president. I want to thank Michael and his colleagues on the board for the opportunity to say a few words today and for their infinite wisdom. You have made an inspired choice. Mog will touch individual lives and steward the intellectual traditions and fabric of this celebrated college. And if I may say so, she wears purple very well. I'm humbled and grateful to have been selected to receive an honorary degree from Williams College after having conferred so many honorary degrees over my last six years. It's great to be on the receiving end. And it confirms that there really is no downside to being overeducated. <laughs> this is a historic and special day for Williams. And it's one that will generate joy and hope long after the sun sets this evening. But it does come at a tumultuous time in this country. Divisions persist around issues of race and identity and equity and free expression and the value of science and claims on truth. And as always, this turbulence is reflected on college and university campuses across the country. In this context, it's very reasonable to ask why anyone would want to be a college president a demanding 24-7 job in the crosshairs of so many divisive issues. It's not too late to change your mind. <laughs> Just joking, no. <laughs> I'm going to attempt to answer that question today, and I'm, I'll begin by going back in time just a little bit. I think few here will have forgotten what transpired on the University of Virginia campus in Charlottesville just a little bit more than a year ago. The hateful, violent expressions of neo-Nazism and white supremacy that we all witnessed were deeply disturbing. They were contrary to human decency. And in the aftermath of that event, I knew that we had to bring the Brown campus together to reflect on the meaning of what had happened. During the first week of classes a year ago, we invited seven faculty members to examine the complex history of white nationalism in America, how it came to be, why it's persisted, how we might counter it. And I knew that Maude Mandel had to be part of that group. When Maude spoke, 
She bridged past and present by drawing on her scholarship on anti-Semitism in Europe in the 1920s and 30s, and centered on the concept of social death. What preceded full-blown full blown genocide, she said, was social death, when neighbors turned on neighbors, boycotted their shops, and looked away when people they had long known were, were assaulted in the street. Jews experienced this social death. They were turned into outsiders. Among the lessons of the history of anti-Semitism, Mog concluded, is the call on all of us to disavow the turning away that leads to social death. Because we're all implicated in making sure that the society in which we live in is socially just. The panel was powerful, and it prompted the kind of hard, emotionally fraught, and intellectually intense conversations that just clarify the value and purpose of higher education, especially during difficult times. And I was reminded of what members of the Brown's 50th reunion classes often tell me about being students in the 1960s, a time of convulsive social upheaval, that their college experience had another weightier layer of real-time learning that enriched their classes and drove their decisions about their lives. The stakes seemed very high. Now is then, there's an edginess about the time. And it's telling that Maud Mandel is rising to the challenge, meeting it head on with her signature intellect and humility and joy. It's equally telling that Mog will do so here at Williams, a place that, like Brown, has always welcomed difficult conversations. Our histories are distinct, but they follow a common trajectory. Both institutions champion liberal founding values that have stood the test of time for generations. And both institutions experienced watershed moments that profoundly changed them, many by grappling with what it means for some people to be inside while others are outside. If you know your Williams College history, you know about John Aubrey Davis, class of 33. He organized a boycott of a white-owned hamburger grill that fired its black employees so it could hire white replacements. And he later served along Thurgood Marshall, in crafting the Brown v. Board education decision. One example. If you know your Brown University history, you know about Brown student James Talmadge, who had the audacity to call for the abolition of slavery at the university's commencement ceremony in 1790, a time when some members of the Brown University Corporation in attendance still own slaves. At Williams and Brown, it's expected that we approach complex and difficult issues with knowledge and understanding. So it may not be surprising that Maud's arrival at Williams is not the first intellectual link between our two institutions. In fact, we've both benefited by attracting each other's graduates as professors. Consider Liz Hoover. Williams class of 2001, now Manning Assistant Professor of American Studies at Brown, and somebody we're very fortunate to have. For decades, Native Americans have been regarded as the other, living outside the larger society, on reservations rife with poverty and crime and chronic health issues. While there are sobering realities to that narrative of Native life, it's decidedly incomplete. It overlooks the cultural resilience that Native communities marshal in the face of systemic ne neglect and discrimination. And this is exactly what Liz Hoover uh, explores in her own work. In her powerful book, The River is in Us, Liz tells the story of the Akwesasne, an upstate New York Mohawk community about 250 miles north of here, downwind and downstream of three Superfund sites. In researching public health problems linked to polluted air and water, Liz collaborated with a Mohawk midwife who wanted to learn whether it was safe for Akwesasne mothers to breastfeed their babies while eating traditional food, fish from the St. Lawrence River, known to be contaminated with PCBs from the Superfund sites. The midwife convinced external researchers to study the breast milk of tribal women, but she also insisted that the women not simply be subjects of the study, but participants who would be trained to co collect biological samples. The result, 
Engaging the citizens of Akwesasne to be agents of change sparked an environmental justice movement. Members of the community gained valuable public health skills. Scientists collaborated with the tribe in ways that protected people's health and preserved culture. And a model for more inclusive community-based research emerged from the work. Then consider Neil Roberts, Mellon May's fellow and Brown class of 1998, now associate professor of Africana Studies at Williams. He touts the historical importance of agency as an animating force, both in the lives of slaves and in the actions of their descendants in the long struggle for civil rights. In his research on the contributions of Frederick Douglass to political thought, Neil cites his enduring worldview. He credits Douglass, for example, with expanding the notion of individual potential by arguing that the America he knew called on citizens to improve not only their own lives, but the lives of members of their communities. On a podcast promoting his recently published edited volume, A Political Companion to Frederick Douglass, he talks about how the Black Lives Matter movement embodies what Douglass called, quote, the spirit of rational hopefulness. To his way of thinking, every person in a democracy has the innate ability and obligation to act. And against today's divisive backdrop, this spirit prompts acts of rehumanization instead of silence, negativity, or denigration of others. This is the opposite of social death. As Frederick Douglass observed in an 1889 speech, the beauty of today is to meet the questions of today with intelligence and courage. In their work, both of these scholars probed the notion of active citizenship, in particular the urgency and the agency of claiming it when it's denied. And in doing so, they demonstrate a value that both Brown and Williams hold dear, that the power of knowledge resides in how it helps us develop and form convictions that drive principled actions that repair the world to bridge outside and inside. And this brings us back here to this moment, to the inauguration of Maude Mandel as president of Williams College. Many of you, I have su suspect, have read this wonderful piece about Maude in Williams Magazine, your alumni publication. I loved reading it. In it, Maude reflects on meaningful moments in her life, most notably befriending a community of Armenian refugees while studying abroad in France and learning about her maternal grandfather, a Holocaust survivor who was imprisoned at Dachau during Kristallnacht. And it should surprise exactly nobody that these moments left a mark. Among Maud's most compelling qualities as a person and as an educator is her deep reservoir of compassion for those in diaspora, in conflict, or somehow outside the human embrace because of who they are. In the Williams Magazine piece, Maude revealed her cards with all of the authenticity that endeared her to us at Brown, noting, quote, I find people fascinating, and the communities and college campuses that we build together are such a fascinating mix of diverse peoples who are trying to figure out how to live together, work together, and most importantly, learn together. And that's as it should be. University campuses will always be in the vanguard during times of profound social change because the expansion of knowledge goes on. Ways of learning and knowing blossom, nurtured by the diverse and sometimes searing experiences of people who've been on the outside. And therein lies a kernel of truth about the future of higher education and about Maude Mandel's place in leading us there. As we ask what it means to educate the college students of today and tomorrow, I believe that somewhere in the mix of worthy educational outcomes is to be an engaged citizen. More than ever, higher education must prepare students to not just acquire knowledge, but to apply it in ways that elevate the public good, restore civic discourse, bring out the best in others. Last spring, our Square Center for Public Service launched the Higher Education and Democratic Practice Initiative, 
which aims to broaden students' understanding of democracy. It's continuing this year. This was, of course, an idea hatched by Bob Medell. She sees the value of informed debate among people with different views and of understanding principles like the rule of law and ethical governance. These are among the ways that people are brought inside. So let me conclude by saying that for nearly 20 years, Maude Mandel, as an esteemed member of the faculty and a beloved dean of the college, embodied the intellectual independence and the fierce social conscience that has long animated Brown University. And as all of you will come to know, if you don't already, Maud Mandel embodies the intellectual energy and the spirited can-do culture that has long animated Williams College. Under her thoughtful guidance and a spirit of great collegiality, and yes, a spirit of great fun, Williams will continue to thrive even in times of tumult and change. So it may be indeed be a fraught moment to be a college president, but no one on the planet is as prepared and perfectly attuned to take on this role as Maud Mandel. And for Williams, it's the perfect time to have Maud at its helm. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chris. And Maud, would you please come forward once again? So now, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of Williams College, I give you this charter and declare you the 18th president of Williams College. The trustees, faculty, staff, Students, alumni, parents, and friends of Williams stand in deep and unwavering support of you as you begin your, stu your stewardship of our beloved institution. And it is now my honor, my privilege, and my great pleasure to invite you to hear from our 18th president, Maud S. Mandel. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Chris, friends, students, faculty, alumni, family, community members, staff. It's really uh, such a tremendous honor to be here today uh, and um, incredibly moving uh, to have all of you here to share this exciting moment in the life of my, of my, my family's uh, arrival here in this wonderful Purple Valley. Um, as many of you know and have heard repeatedly today, the organizing theme for today's programming and events has been Inside Outside. Uh, and I'll come back in a moment to my thoughts on how we chose that theme with the faculty and some ways that it applies to our work at Williams. But before I do that, I want to start by acknowledging that this entire process of becoming your 18th president has involved a massive and exciting shift as I moved from outside Williams to very, very much inside. It would be hard to overstate just how moved I am to be before you today 
and just how fully embraced Steve, Lev, Ava, and I feel by the Williams community, and we really thank you for that. Thank you for this welcome and this exceptional opportunity. Thank you, too, to the loved ones who came to share this moment, one from across the Atlantic. Thank you to my teachers and my mentors, several here in this room who modeled the habits of work and mind that enabled me to get here, including my doctoral advisor, Todd Endelman, to important colleague members at Brown from when I started there, Calvin Goldscheider and Saul Olian, and the provost, Rick Locke, uh, who's guided me here to this moment today. It is deeply moving to have them here and everybody else uh, who has come to be here with me. And of course, to President Christina Paxson, from whom you've just heard, who has been a true source of inspiration. I would certainly not be here today have, had Chris not appointed me Dean of the College in Brown at tw in 2014. And her high standards, her work ethic, and her vision are a model of inspired academic leadership that I will work hard to emulate at Williams. Uh, and I will just add that if uh, becoming a college president is a daunting adventure, uh, I feel that I'm following in fantastic footsteps, uh, and I learned everything I know from Christina Paxson. So uh, it, is, it was a pathway that uh, was mapped out for me, uh, and I therefore feel quite uh, carefully guided to this next step. It was not easy to leave Chris or Brown, my home for the last 20 years, but maybe the distance is not so great. Chris just described some of the many historical ties between Brown and Williams. Those ties are embodied in the sight of so many of my friends from Brown University or who are here, including Janet Cooper Nelson, from you've heard, alongside my newer friends from Williams. And among the latter, I certainly must count Michael Eisenson's and the William Trustees and Search Committee, uh, and must thank you for putting such faith in me with your choice. I really thank you from the bottom of my heart. By virtue of their decision, I join a distinguished line of Williams presidents who have stewarded this institution through centuries. A number of them are here today, and I want to acknowledge them for their contributions and the welcome that they have extended to me. John Chandler, Frank Oley, Oakley, Bill Wagner, Adam Falk, and Tico Majunder, as well as two others who unfortunately could not be with us today but who uh, have been equally gracious in extending a welcome to me, Morty Shapiro and Carl Vogt. As Michael Eisenson described in his remarks earlier, the visionary work that you, my predecessors, have done has positioned Williams exceptionally well to our extend our already long tradition of excellence in liberal arts education. Williams College, like its peers, has sought to introduce students to the breadth of human knowledge, while also encouraging them to explore particular areas of interest in greater depth. The goal has been to inspire students to engage in practices of lifelong learning through channeling their curiosity, honing their analytic skills, and challenging their assumptions. There's a practical aspect, too, Schools like Williams are not just sites of intellectual exploration. In the modern United States, we are also expected to equip students for practical careers. If you study Williams history, you see how quickly we have gone from preparing students to embark on relatively settled and predictable career paths to entering job markets that may be entirely different from one year to the next. And as my own children enter uh, into this phase of their higher education, my son just beginning that adventure, uh, and my daughter a few years behind, it's astounding to think about the changing environment in which they are going to enter and the ways in which uh, the careers that they might choose to pursue may not, in fact, have even been invented yet. Moreover, we do this work in a distinctly American mode that sees education as a combination of intellectual, personal, and professional development. The ambitious goal is to teach students that there are intrinsic connections between being an economic and social actor and a moral and political agent, an idea we would do well to stress all the more strongly in the current environment. 
This is one of the many ways in which the theme for today's events, inside, outside, relates to the idea of a Williams education. We strive to help students appreciate the relationship between their external lives as professionals, citizens, and neighbors, and their internal happiness and health. We work toward this goal through the close professor-student bond that flourish, flourishes both inside and outside our classrooms. Indeed, teaching, as was reaffirmed to me during my discussions with dozens of faculties this summer, is of paramount importance to the scholars who make up this community. It is a mission that I embrace wholeheartedly as an Oberlin alumna and the daughter of educators. Indeed, one of my earliest memories is attending my father's college classes, over there, as he experimented with new ways of teaching modern drama. He knew that to inspire students, you had to recognize their insights, no matter how developed, as contributing to a collective project of joint learning. That is why I, as a 10-year-old girl, could attend his classes and participate. As long as I read the play and listened closely, I was welcome to join the conversation. From this experience, I learned that we all have something to contribute and that the classroom is a space to test ideas, take risks, and explore. I often what, wonder what lessons the students took from seeing me there, too. I will note that my father stopped the practice of bringing me when I started to look a little more like them and a little older. <laughs> so we both feared that uh, it might start to not look so cute at that point. <laughs> but joking aside, my father's courses taught me at a young age how essential the professor was to setting a tone in the class that encouraged the most ambitious learning environment. At Williams, this, committing to this commitment to teaching sits at the core of our school. Indeed, one such Williams faculty member and former president, John Chandler, noted in his own induction speech almost exactly 45 years ago, and I quote, the teachers who are the most committed to the importance of the issues in their field will want to lead their students beyond the areas of safe generalization to the more confused and puzzling questions that may be difficult to formulate, much less answer. One of the considerable strengths of this college with its human scale and community spirit is that students and teachers may easily step out of their respective professional roles and relate to one another simply as human beings. When friendship becomes the broader context of the teacher-student relationship, then the larger perplexity and questions that are on the minds of students find a natural forum that augments the function of the classroom. Um, and as a side note, I, I would just mention uh, that, again, talking to faculty as I uh, interviewed and chatted with chairs and others across the campus this summer, uh, I heard faculty say again and again how much they valued the experience of working with Williams undergrads in the friendships and conversations that they formed there. Uh, a fact that students has re have reaffirmed for me in conversations that I have had with them. So this ethos, then, is central to the Williams Project, if I can call it that, a project that builds on the faculty-student bond to make clear to students that learning is a lifelong process that imparts skills that they can use to thrive in any setting, that increasingly asks them to embrace our responsibility to the natural world in which we live and on which we depend, and that encourages them to interact from people with, from a broad spectrum of backgrounds. That latter goal is particularly dear to my heart. It also points to another way in which ideas of inside and outside are relevant to Williams and to my presidency. As some of you may have read in the Williams Magazine, I'm the granddaughter of Austrian Jewish refugees who fled with their nine-month-old daughter, my mother, via Hamburg in 1939 on the SS St. Louis. The last boat to leave Germany carrying Jews, the ship was turned away from its destination port in Cuba at the last minute. After also being denied entrance by the United States and Canada, and with Florida still visible from the deck, the captain brought the ship about and returned his 937 passengers to Europe. As distressing as that rejection was, they were saved from a grim fate by four countries that took them in, Great Britain, France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. 
My family was exceptionally lucky to be among those welcomed to Great Britain, which was the only of the four not to be later occupied by the Nazis. Many others have tried to leave but were prevented, often at the cost of their lives. I was named after my great-grandmother, Mindel Strum, who was killed in Poland, along with three generations of her family. The S that I always include when I sign my name, Maud Strum Mandel, is a testament to her and the millions of others who perished. In that way, I am connected to both those who found freedom and those to whom it was denied. These histories of my mother's narrow escape and of the murder of her extended family were formative to my thinking about our collective obligations to inclusion and justice. Although historical details may vary, many families, regardless of backgrounds, have their own experience illustrating the precariousness of liberty and the dangers of life on the margins. Subsequent chapters in my family's history have taught me the power of fighting to protect rights for all. Having survived that arduous ocean voyage on the St. Louis and finally migrating to the United States at nine years old, my mother dedicated her adult life to extending opportunities to others. As an expert on and proponent of women's political leadership, her efforts and those of other feminist activists of her generation helped clear the path that led me onto this stage before all of you today. I would like to pause briefly on that point. As you know, Williams is celebrating 50 years of co-education. So while at one point in recent history, I, as a woman, could not have matriculated here, I now stand before you as the first woman president of a school that graduates hundreds of women every year and that has committed itself to providing access and opportunities to students of all kinds from the widest array of backgrounds. Those profound changes happened within living memory. There are women from that first entering class who are in the room today. And as they can attest, it all happened without us losing sight of what makes Williams Williams. While we have a great deal of work ahead and always will, I am inspired by this college's recognition that in order to reach our collective aspirations, we must not isolate, but connect, must not marginalize, but embrace, must not exclude, but admit and nurture talent, whatever its origins and forms. The fight for opportunity and access is never over, nor does it proceed in a straight line. The German and Austrian Jews of my grandparents' generation enjoyed civil liberties, professional opportunities, and economic stability that were unimaginable to their own grandparents. But that civil society was demolished by a wave of expropriation and imprisonment and mass murder. And then, just as quickly in historical terms, Germany turned back toward a European model of democracy, an imperfect one, but certainly light years away from the national socialist past. Even for someone like me, who's made a life of studying history, these vacillations are striking. Past performance has not predicted future results in any linear way. We humans are much more complex than that. France, the country on which I have focused my scholarly work, is another prime illustration. France was simultaneously the first country in the world to politically emancipate its Jewish minorities and the first European nation to voluntarily deliver its Jewish residents to the Nazis. Not to mention its role in the subjugation of millions of colonial subjects in Africa and elsewhere at the very moment when it was extending democratic practices at home. So my family's biography and my scholarship both point out the simultaneous promise and fragility of liberty and opportunity. This notion of who is inside and who is outside has real world implications. When we teach students to debate, learn from, and live with one another, we are giving them more than an education in chemistry or art history or political science, or those are, although those are absolutely invaluable. We are expanding opportunities, bringing together the best minds, and equipping them to take on the most pressing challenges. We are re redefining who belongs and who has a voice and a say in how things are done. Actually, in college, I sometimes think we're teaching them that everyone has a say in everything. <laughs> but I would rather start there 
than in any other extreme. Social science teaches us that more diverse teams are likely to come up with more creative solutions to complex problems. Likewise, diverse learning communities need to ask members to contribute their own views and to learn from their peers. These can be hard lessons to teach and to learn. They test students' assumptions and beliefs, and sometimes even the ideals they hold sacred. That is true on all sides. Whether a student comes away with their faith reaffirmed or reconsidered, the very experience of being tested asks them to become the best version of themselves. It is this commitment that makes learning communities thrilling and rewarding places to work and live because they are at once heterogeneously alive while also always imperfect and searching. Our success in that messy enterprise depends, us on, depends on us agreeing to look at each other as fellow, human, as fellow human beings. Williams has this vital humanity at its core. It has been nurtured and fed by our liberal arts values, which include our commitment to evidence and attention, to the benefits of cogent analysis and argument, to economy and elegance of expression, to shared governance and respect for the spirit of community, to the potential of our students as both brilliant minds and whole people capable of serving humanity at its highest level. And that brings me to my final way of expressing my gratitude to you today, and perhaps the most meaningful one. Having now literally said thank you many times, and having also entrusted you with some of my personal stories, I also vow to show you my appreciation by continuing to dedicate myself to the college and to all of you. I intend to demonstrate through my own service the passion I feel for this adventure we are on together and the appreciation I hold in my heart for the chance you have given me to lead Williams on the next leg of its wonderful, momentous, and essential journey. Thank you very much. The mountains, we greet them with a song whose echoes rebounding their woodland nights along shall mingle with echoes and winds and mountains sing. Till hill and valley gaily, gaily ring. Well done. 
As we prepare to take leave this afternoon, committed as a community to the principles and practices of inclusion to ensure that, as President Mandel has challenged us to redefine who belongs and who has a say in how things are done, let us also remind ourselves that this work places a great demand on us, calling on each member of our Williams community to that task. It is a call that asks us to cultivate our inner lives as we seek to live up to this charge. In the Talmud, the ancient repository of Jewish wisdom, the sage Rabbi comments on a peculiar passage from the Hebrew Bible. He wonders why it is written that the ark in which the Ten Commandments are kept is to be covered with gold, not only on the outside, but on the inside as well. After all, covering both the inside and the outside seems unnecessary. But we are told that there is an important lesson to be derived from this detail. And that is that we should strive to make our insides like our outsides. In Hebrew, tocho kivaro. That when acting in the world, we should strive to act with integrity. That we should align our inner and outer beings. And that we should speak words that match the highest intentions of our heart. And that as we do our work in the world, we take inspiration from those we encounter and bring that inside to transform ourselves. That we should speak truthfully, strive to live with a pure heart, and seek to serve others. May we, the Williams community, under the leadership of President Mandel, create a brighter future together, growing as learners, scholars, and citizens who work for the well-being of our world. Special Sheriff, pray, bring these ceremonies to a close.